If you already know the basics of Node.js and have already tried building small applications like APIs with it, you're already at a level where you need to learn how to properly architect those and set up these projects. Okay, so the very first thing that you need to know is a thing called three layer approach. Why is it called so and what does it mean? Let's go over to the blackboard. And here we have a typical scenario of this communication in your server. A client makes a request to let's say create an order. So routes already know which controller is responsible for creating an order. And it's going to reroute this request based on the request data, of course, to this controller. Then this controller is going to contact the database to create a new entry. But this scenario looks very simple and it's for a reason. Well, if you're building some kind of a pet project or in your hackathon and you need to save time, please go for it. But otherwise, this is a really bad practice and it's not scalable at all. So the right way of doing this looks like this. Let me zoom out. So a client makes a request to the server. Routes already know that it needs to re-forward the request to this controller because this controller is taking care of creating orders, all right? But the actual purpose of controllers is actually receiving the request and sending the response. It's not designed to, or it's, its purpose, it's not to handle the business logic. Therefore, it contacts the service or the business logic service, does all the needed processing, and then it needs to create and still needs to create an entry in the database, right? And then the service is not going to do it directly by communicate by talking to the database, but rather accessing this model layer, this data layer. And this data layer already has this SQL query attached to it or predefined, then that it's going to use to communicate to the database. All right. And that's why it's called a three layer approach. So we have one layer, second layer and third layer. And this is much more scalable because you can define multiple services that can work for not only one, but also for other. And this is how it would basically look in real life. Let's say we have controllers, we have models where our layer data layer is. This is where we're actually communicating with the database. All right. So find one is basically an ORM to, to talk to the database. And if we go to control controllers, let's say an order controller, this one, create an order. Okay, we do some validation, as I said, and here we are creating an order or calling the data layer. But this is a very simplified example. And that's why we don't use the services here. Okay, why not? Because it's simple. But let's say we, we would add more logic to this. Let's say we would need to contact some kind of a third party server to access the order details, then we would need to check if user has permissions to create an order. Okay. And let's say we need to verify that we have the needed thing that we're going to ship to the customer in the inventory. All right. So, and then this becomes bulky. Obviously you wouldn't do this in a controller, but move all of that logic into a service and the services would live usually in a separate folder. All right, so the next thing would be the actual filter structure. We already had a glimpse of it, but let's go over it once again. So the request comes here to the routers and the routers look like this. Routers already know which um, controller it's going to contact. Let's say to read orders, we're gonna do this. To update on order, we're gonna do, you can contact this one to delete this one. And then here are the controllers. So the controller, for the order is here to create an order and then to read an order and so on. What the controller is going to do, it's going to contact the service to process the business logic, right, for the orders. And then the service is going to use a model like this one, for example, to create an order. All right, what do we have next? We also have schemas which define how your database schema look like, for example, when you're working with MongoDB. And we have some shared utility functions and we have subscribers, which we're gonna go over in a second. Okay, now let's say you have a bigger project it's not just one microservice, but you actually have a monorepo with multiple microservices living inside one monorepo. How would you structure, how would your folder structure look then? Well, it would look quite similar, but then inside the app, you would have your different microservices or code for your services. So for the order service, you would have everything here, and then you would create a new folder. Let's call it payments. And then it would look identical to orders pretty much. And that's it. And also you would have libs, for example, a lib for logging, and it would be a package that you can also publish on NPM and then use across all of your uh, services here. 
Okay, the next thing is actually utilizing the pop sub pattern in your Node.js project. Whenever you, uh, sometimes you have a need to be able to listen to a specific event. For example, a user has been created and you need to perform different actions in different parts of your application based on a user creation. And then we can simply listen to this user creation and then do something here. And we're going to put all of these subscriptions because we can have multiple subscriptions, for example, for a creation and then for deletion into a specific file and act right here. All right, so the next point is testing. And actually, that's a quite an interesting one. And it depends on your team and your application that you're building. But generally, what I would suggest is having obviously unit tests for your controllers and your services, then I would definitely suggest having contract tests. Because if you have a microservice architecture, you want to make sure that your communication is stable. And I have a video made about exactly this topic. And I went very in depth about it. So check it out. You have a link in the description too. And the last but not least, you need to have integration tests, but not too many of them, maybe just to actually spin up the servers or your market services and check the communication and data manipulation between them. All right, now let's talk about logging and application monitoring. These are actually two different things. For logging, which is very important, and I cannot stress this enough for not only debugging purposes, but also for legal purposes, you need to use one of the very established libraries like, like Morgan, for example. And for application monitoring, which which does actually a lot of things like monitoring the health of your services, monitoring the performance, logging the errors and so on. You might use Sentry or AppSignal or Datadog and this kind of platforms. Of course, you need to pay for them if you're an organization, but it's very much worth it. And last but not least, just follow the general good code rules. So first, first of all, try to keep your code clean by enabling a linter and having a, a static code analysis tools like SonarCube. And also try to follow a specific style guide, like a Google style guide or Airbnb style guide. It's the style guide. It's definitely going to help you with maintaining clean code. If you liked the video, as always, please leave a like so that this video gets shown to more people. You're definitely going to make me a fa big favor. And otherwise, I'm going to see you in the next video. And please check out other playlists. I think you're going to like that as well.